This evening we will have the third lecture of our new series, Museum Talk from the USA, and Erin Coburn, the former chief officer of digital media at Metropolitan Museum, is our guest. First of all, I would like to thank her for joining us. Welcome to Istanbul, Erin. Erin Coburn will speak about the use of digital media to enhance the visitor experience. She will provide insights into how digital media and new technologies can change the viewing, exploring, and experiencing works of art in museums. She will also give examples of the opportunities they offer to reach beyond the museum to online visitors. And I would like to briefly introduce this lecture series, the Museum Talk from the USA, for our audience who join us this evening for the first time. In the next month, we will have significant guests from leading American museums, and we will continue to have one or two lectures from an important speaker each month. Each lecture is about a key topic, such as museum management, curatorial practices, collections and archives, audience development and public relations, education and social programs, events, local and global marketing and communication strategies, new technologies, redefinition of space, and museum architecture. The history of museology and art institutions in the USA have laid impressions on today's museum practices and left an impact on the proceedings of cultural institutions all around the world. In this respect, museum directors, curators, and department directors from established art museums in the USA will be invited to share their knowledge and experience. And I truly believe this series is an important reference and guide for museum studies in Turkey. Istanbul Modern is making this series in partnership with US Mission in Turkey. I would like to thank them for this wonderful cooperation. And now I would like to give the floor to Erin. Please, Erin. Good evening, everyone. Let's, can we turn this mic off and leave this mic on? Perfect. Uh, how's, how's the volume? Can you hear me OK? It's good out there in the back? Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. This is my first time in Istanbul, and I had a, a wonderful day exploring the museum, and I look forward to exploring the city this weekend. So tonight, I'm going to talk about how to use digital media to enhance the visitor experience. And I'm going to focus not just on what this means in gallery, but also what it means online and through mobile solutions. Because in many respects, this is an integrated experience. Our visitors today extend far beyond the walls of our physical museums. Now, um, I most recently was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I was their first chief officer of digital media, and I was there for two and a half years. I just left that position about two weeks ago, and I'm now doing independent museum consulting. Prior to being at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I was at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, where I was there for 14 years. And so tonight, what I want to do is share with you examples of using digital media to enhance a visitor experience, both at the Getty Museum and at the Metropolitan Museum. So let me start by introducing these two museums to you. The Metropolitan Museum is located in New York. It was founded in 1870, so it is one of the older American museums. It has an encyclopedic collection, so it has a collection that spans from prehistory all the way till modern times. It's a very, very diverse collection, having works of art from all around the world. It's a very big collection. We have about roughly 1.7 million works of art. There are 17 different broad collecting areas. These are some images of some of the galleries at the Met. The, the Met spans four city blocks. It's two million square feet and has over 450 galleries. It's a very, very big space. Last year, the Met had roughly 6.2 million people who came to visit. And of that 6.2 million, roughly 35 to 40 percent are international visitors. Now, the Getty Museum is located in Los Angeles, and the Getty is part of the Getty Trust. There are four programs. There's a museum, a foundation, a conservation institute, and a research institute. And all these programs were brought together into a new campus, which you see here up on the screen, which opened in 1997. And it was designed by the architect Richard Meyer. And you can see some gardens up there, 
uh, that are part of the museum, which was designed by the artist Robert Irwin. And this is a much smaller collection. There's six different collecting areas, photographs, paintings, drawings, manuscripts, sculpture, and decorative arts. And their visitorship is around 1.2 million, 1.3 million people a year. There's also the Getty Villa, which is located along the coast in Los Angeles in a town called Malibu. And this was the original home for J. Paul Getty, who founded the museum. Back in the 1950s, he opened his museum up, up to the, open to the public. And then in the 1970s, he constructed the villa that you see up on the screen, which today houses the antiquities collection for the Getty. And so tonight, I'll share examples from you from the Met, from the Getty Center, and from the Getty Villa. OK, so let's get started. The way that I like to think about how you approach using digital media to enhance a visitor experience is to think of it as a seamless experience. And what I mean by seamless is that a visitor should be able to go to a museum's website and use that website to help plan for their visit. And up on the top corner of your screen, you see a, an image of the Metropolitan Museum of Art's website. And we have suggested itineraries of what you might want to do when you come to visit the Met. Then when a visitor comes to the museum, ideally, they should be able to use their own handheld device. Or they should be able to rent a handheld device or a smartphone or an iPod to be able to access more information about the works of art that they're seeing or to access information about the exhibitions that are on view. If there is media that is used in gallery, they should also be able to access that media when they go home onto a website. And this is because I'm a firm believer that you shouldn't have to spend all of your time looking at digital media in the galleries. You should be able to use it to enhance your exploration and your understanding and know that you can go home and still continue that experience. And then when you're in the galleries, if you're like the young boy who's kneeling on the floor or sitting on the floor in the paintings gallery that you see up on the screen, if you want nothing to do with technology, if you don't want to use your phone, you don't want to engage with media, you just want an uninterrupted experience of viewing works of art, I still believe that that visitor should be able to go home and all those works of art that they just fell in love with, they should be able to keep learning about on a museum's website after they leave the galleries. So that's what I mean by a seamless experience. And you'll see how this applies through some of the examples that I give tonight. So let's start first with the online visitor experience. And specifically, what I want to look at is access to collections. Now, at the Met, about a year ago, we redesigned the website. And this was the first major overhaul that had been done to the website in about 10 years. And one of the things that we did in conjunction with redesigning the website is we put all of the Met's cataloged collections online. This comes out to roughly 350,000 works of art. So if, if you're doing the math and you're trying to figure out how did we put 350,000 works of art online when I said the Met has 1.7 million works of art, the, the difference there is that there is, the prints and drawings collection is about 1.2 million works of art. And we're still bringing that into a collections management system and digitizing it. And as that happens, it automatically will go out to the website. But the 350,000 works of art that now are available on the Met's website represent all the other collecting, collecting areas of the Met almost in their entirety. And so when we were designing the collection section of the website, there were a couple of different things that we wanted to achieve. We wanted you to be able to have an optimal experience in viewing works of art, to be able to easily access information on the collection, and to encourage you to want to come see these works of art in person. So the first thing is that you get a slideshow of highlights from the collection, which were highlights that our curators determined were highlights. So you immediately start to see images when you come to the collections area of the site. It's a really good way if you have no idea what you're interested in seeing, or you have no idea what's in the Mets collection, you just want to start giving people images as a starting point. Then we implemented a very robust search interface that is often called a faceted search. And what this is, is this will be familiar to you if you do online shopping. So let's say you go online to buy shoes. And on that website, it says, are you interested in boots? And then what size do you wear? And what color do you want? And what brand are you looking for? And your results get narrower and narrower and narrower. 
That same search technology we apply to the collections area. So you start with really broad categories, who, what, when, where, and as you start to say what you're looking for, your results get narrower and narrower. And so it's a really good way to be able to navigate massive amounts of content. And then, of course, we have a keyword search box because people are used to Google and just being able to enter a keyword. And the way that the keyword search box works is that as you start to type, we implemented something called type ahead. So as you're starting to spell Rembrandt, for example, you're typing in R, E, M, and it starts to fill out what you think that, what we think that you're looking for. And this is a, it works really well if you don't type very well. Like I, I'm not a very good typer, and it's very hard to figure out how to spell artist names, so this is a really good technology to help someone get accurate search results. So let's look at an example of Rembrandt. We encourage our curators to put as much cataloging information as possible available online. So as you can see here, there's a fair amount of descriptive text that's available about this painting. We also have a section of related works. So if you're interested in this Rembrandt, you may also be interested in these other works in the collection. And then for all of the works that don't have copyright protection, we made high resolution images available. And so you can do very, very extensive zooming on these images. And this is really about creating an optimal experience in how you view the works of art online. In terms of, well, I should also point out, we, we actually allow you to download these images as well. So there is a, a download feature so that we encourage you to download them and share them. And then in terms of wanting to help facilitate people coming to see these works of art in person, we let you know if this work of art is on view. If you select on the gallery link, this takes you to a gallery overview page. And every single gallery at the Met, over 450 of them, have a description about that gallery with a section of highlights from that gallery. All the galleries are numbered so that it makes it really easy for you to be able to know which gallery you want to go see if you found it on the website and you definitely want to go see that Rembrandt. And we even have an interactive map. And if you select on the interactive map, it puts a circle around that gallery that you, that you want to go see, and you can pull back on this map and see where that gallery is located next to where the entrance of the museum is, for example. And this interactive map is a one-to-one -one correspondence of the print map that you get at the museum. So you can see how we very much are trying to create an integrated, seamless experience between the on-site, which leads you to the, the online, which leads you to the on-site visit. Okay, so now let me switch over to talking about the in-gallery visitor experience. And I'll give an example from the Getty Center, from the Getty Villa, and from the Metropolitan Museum. Now the approach to thinking about the in-gallery media that we use is that it should be an, ex an extension of the object. We call this object-centric media. And what this means is you have certain information about an object. You have the tombstone information, you have the label information, you have a wall panel. We like to think of interpretive me media, so audio, video, interactives, as being an extension of your understanding about that object. And the reason I point this out is because it's not just about doing technology for technology's sake. It's not just about doing cool digital content because it's cool. This is really thinking about if you're going to use digital media, as an extension of your learning about an object, it should be focused on that object. It should be something that you can't achieve using text or didactic material. So it, it, it really forces you to think thoughtfully about why would you even er, introduce audio, video, or interactives. There's got to be a good, compelling reason to do it. If you're going, you can't just say it's because we think that it's fun. Like there really should be a compelling reason to do it. So I'll start with an example that we did at the Getty Center, and this was an interactive and augmented reality that we did for a display cabinet called the Augsburg Display Cabinet. Now this was for the renovation of the sculpture and decorative art galleries. And here's what the gallery looked like before, and here's what the gallery looks like after. And as you can see, the, in the room, one of the focal points really is this display cabinet. And this display cabinet is a very intricate, complex object which you really wouldn't know if you're just standing in front of it and looking at it. It has all of these, this great technique and wood and material and stories and iconography and structure. But when you're in a museum and you're standing in front of a cabinet like this, you might just think, oh, it's just a piece of furniture. It's just a cabinet. You really don't know what this cabinet can actually do. 
And so we worked with the curators and the conservators and the educators to do an analysis of all the materials and to understand its structure and to do an analysis of the stories and the iconography. And then we pulled all this content together and we created an interactive that is on the label rail next to the object. So you can see a visitor here is actually playing with the interactive. And I'll show you a demonstration of what you can actually do with the interactive. You can spin the interactive around, or spin the display cabinet around, and it tells you what side that you're looking at. All of those numbers that you see are called hotspots. So you can actually click on one of those hotspots, and it gives you more information. You can zoom in. You can actually see label information. You can learn about the iconography. You can learn about the details. You can see the techniques and the relief. And this allows you to have a sort of a personal virtual way in which you navigate and understand this object, which you physically can't do in the space of the museum. You even have a 3D model, so you can look at the different drawers. You can pull out a drawer. You can open it. You could actually select on that number to learn about what would go in the drawers, what the wood technique is. I mean, all, all sorts of things that you can learn. You can flip it upside down, understand how it was positioned on a table so that it can actually spin around. And so this allows a visitor to be able to do something and learn something about an object that otherwise is not readily available to them. Now, I'm a firm believer, as, as I said earlier, that the experience one has with media shouldn't be confined to the physical space of a museum. And so, of course, this interactive is also available on the Getty's website where someone can go home and they can further their exploration with that particular object. But then we decided to do something else because sometimes creating digital content can be expensive, it can be time consuming. So we thought, let's go a step further with this content that we created and let's do an augmented reality with it. And this was back in about 2010 when certainly in American museums, no one was really doing augmented reality. It was something that we heard about, we saw some things in the marketing world, in the advertising world, but certainly not examples in the museum world, at least in American museums. And so we wanted to do an augmented reality because we thought this is a really great way to draw attention to these new galleries that opened at the Getty. We have this augmented reality feature where we instruct someone to print out a marker. And there's, there's actually no sound on this video, it's okay. What you do is you actually hold the marker up to your, your camera on your computer and that renders the display cabinet. And as you're moving the piece of paper around, you're moving around the object. And it allows you a whole different way to be able to engage with an object. It's, a, it's an entirely different experience. And it's, it's actually quite fun. And so this was used as a way to draw a lot of attention about not only the display cabinet, but also the opening of the galleries. And, and I have to say, it actually worked because we had a nice mention in Wired Magazine. It was featured in the Los Angeles Times, and it got a lot of other press. And this really was a way, I, I like to think of this as a good example of how you can take the content, the digital content that you can create, and by making it as widely accessible as possible, you have the opportunity to reach new audiences. And by having it be picked up by press, for example, is a really good way to excite someone about these new galleries, or even this object, because it, it may have been that someone said before, why would I be interested in a display cabinet? And now all of a sudden, because they're navigating it with a piece of paper, they have this whole different sort of interaction and experience with it, and our hope is that it encourages them to want to go see the object in person. So now I'll share with you an animation that we did over at the Getty Villa, and this was for a mummy called the Mummy of Heraclides. This is a, it's a very unique mummy. It's a red shroud mummy, and there is a lot of analysis and research that has been done on this particular mummy. It's also an extremely popular mummy. The, the school groups love it, and every time that they come to see it, often they would ask, how does this work? Like, what is, how does this whole mummification process work? And so the, the curators worked with us to, they, what they wanted to do was create a way to explain the mummification process. And because we believe that media should be an extension of the object, 
we didn't just create a video about mummification. What we did was created an animation that talks about the mummification process as it relates to the mummy of Heraclides. So we took all the information the curators gave us about their knowledge of the mummy and then helped us understand the mummification process. And we created this animation, which is under two minutes, because I also believe that you really shouldn't create long media in the galleries. You, I, I just don't think that people come to museums to want to watch videos all day long. If you're going to introduce media in the galleries, it should be a tangible short amount of media to help them be able to really learn and extend their viewing and understanding, and then they can look at the works of art. So you can see the animation is built into the title wall. I'm also a firm believer that if you incorporate media in the galleries, that you should do so in a way that doesn't interrupt or obstruct the view of looking at a work of art. You can see a group of uh, school kids who are gathering around the animation here, watching it. And then they can directly turn around and look at the mummy of Heraclides. And I, I'll play for you the animation now. It, um, this animation starts with you looking at the mummy in the context of the gallery. And then it's going to start into the animation. And then it's going to conclude with you looking at the mummy in the galleries. And again, this is to, to always remind the visitor that the learning that you are experiencing is from an actual physical object in the collection. This is a mummy of a young man named Heraclides. He died in Egypt in the first century AD when he was about 20 years old. Mummification was developed by the ancient Egyptians to preserve the body for the afterlife. Typically, all internal organs were removed before mummification with the exception of the heart but in this case, the heart was removed and the lungs were left intact. Next, the body was covered with salt and left for about 40 days until all moisture was eliminated. Perfumed oils and plant resins were rubbed on the body. Thick layers of resin were applied to glue the strips of linen that were wrapped around the body. The mummy was placed on a wooden board and more wrappings bound them together. A mysterious pouch, perhaps of religious significance, was placed on the chest. A mummified ibis, a wading bird with a slender, down-curved bill, was placed on the abdomen. Ibis mummies commonly served as votive offerings to the gods, but this is an unusual case of a bird being mummified with a deceased human. Long linen strips further secured the wrappings. A portrait panel of Heraclides was placed over the face. A large linen cloth was wrapped around the mummy. The shroud was painted red with an imported lead-based pigment. This treatment is rare. Very few red shroud mummies are known to exist. Egyptian symbols of protection and rebirth were painted on the outer cloth with pigments and gold. Finally, Heraclides' name was written in Greek at the feet. Thanks to this remarkable mummification process, Heraclides' body is with us today. Can you hear me? Oh, now I'll get back on. You can see how the animation not just explains the mummification process, but helps you learn something about the actual mummy, pulling from all of the extensive research that has already been done. So you can actually learn that it's, it's unusual that he was mummified with a bird, and that there's actually a bird somewhere there uh, and with him. And you can learn about his age and, and lots of other things that helps you understand the actual object. So now, of course, this animation is also available on the Getty's website. We make it available for you to download to your phone or to your desktop. So this is, again, very much about encouraging people to take the media that you create and, in their own circles, share it as widely as possible. 
It's also available on the Getty's YouTube page, which allows you to reach a very broad audience. And then it's also available on ArtBabble. And if, if you don't know ArtBabble, it's, it's what's referred to as like the YouTube for art lovers. It's um, where a lot of museums post their art videos. And so this is about disseminating your media to reach multiple audiences to as many different places as possible. And then I'll show you an example from the Metropolitan Museum. And this is actually a video that we did around the, um, the new Islamic galleries that opened about a year ago. And they're stunning, stunning galleries. We actually did interactives for the, some of these galleries as well. But what I want to show you is a, a video tonight because I've showed you an interactive and I've showed you an animation and augmented reality. But sometimes video is a very effective means to be able to tell a story. So one of the galleries that is part of the new Islamic wing is a Moroccan court. And this Moroccan court, what the Met actually did was brought in craftsmen and artisan from Morocco to actually construct the court as part of the new galleries. And you wouldn't necessarily know this if you were just going through the galleries and you were experiencing this fantastic Moroccan court. So what you see playing on the, the lower sides of your screen is a video footage that we shot over about a six month period of the craftsmen actually constructing the court using very traditional techniques. This is a model after a 14th century um, interior court. And I'm showing you a heavily edited version of it because I want you to be able to see about as much different footage as we possibly captured. But the idea is that you can see in the top image, there's a monitor screen just outside the Moroccan court. And the idea is that you can go inside the Moroccan court, you can have an enjoyable experience of, of looking at the court, of being in it, step outside it, go to a monitor, and this video is broken down into multiple segments. So you can watch a segment that might interest you. And you can actually see the incredible technique and methods and craftsmanship that was put into creating this court that you otherwise may not have known existed. And that you watch this, have a whole new appreciation and understanding for what just happened. Step back into the Moroccan court and you look at it with entirely new set of eyes in, in certain respects. So then, of course, what we did with this video is we made it as widely available online as possible. So a, a portion of that video is featured in a blog that our director wrote, which is what you see up on the screen. We also did a special website for the opening of the new galleries, which was translated in multiple languages, and we featured the video there as well. The video is also featured in the Met's media gallery section, where we make all of our videos and interactives and audio available. And again, even with the Met site, we allow you to download it, to share it, to embed it. So we very much encourage the sharing of this media. Of course, it's also available on our YouTube channel. It was heavily tweeted about, posted in Facebook. And we even made it available to the journalist. So the New York Times did an article on the construction of the Moroccan court, and they featured the video as part of the newspaper article. And this is really fantastic because you know, only, only so many people go to a museum's website. At the Met, it's actually quite a lot of people. But it's to be able to have the New York Times feature media that we've created to help you understand something about this new Moroccan court opens it up to an entirely new audience and we hope really encourages them to want to come and see it. So now I'm going to focus on um, mobile solutions. And mobile, in many respects, is definitely one of the fastest growing technologies in our world in terms of technologies. And that, no doubt, is having a huge impact on museums and how we actually address that. So I'll share with you examples from the Metropolitan Museum with mobile. And we'll look at a mobile website, a partnership that we did with Google to do image recognition searching, and then the Met's first app that we created, and then also a game that we did. So starting with the, the mobile website, a mobile website is it's different than an app. What a mobile website is is when you take a website and you optimize it for your smartphone. 
So the content is exactly the same. All you're doing is reformatting the presentation so that it's easy to read on your phone. And so up here on the screen, you see the suggested itineraries page from the Met's website. And then directly next to it, you can see how that has been optimized to look easy to read on your phone. When we redesigned the Met's website, what we did is we took all the portions of the website that relate to the visitor experience. So visit information, exhibition information, collection information, gallery overviews, events, a feature where you can personalize your visit. And that's what we optimized for your phone. And then what we've been doing is wiring all the galleries at the Met. And it's, the building's about you know, 100 and something years old, so it's, it's taken a while, but about half the galleries have been wired now. And the idea is that you can pull out your own phone. Every work of art that's on view at the Met is on the Met's website. So if you pull out your own phone, you can access the Met's free public Wi-Fi. You can easily search on a work of art that you're standing in front of. And because we're encouraging the curators to put as much information about the object online, if you access it on your phone, you often get more information than just what's in the label in front of you. So it's a way to be able to get added information about the objects that you're looking at. So then what we decided to do is to partner with Google to do image recognition searching. And this only works for two-dimensional objects. So it, it doesn't work with sculptures, doesn't work with furniture, doesn't work with any 3D objects. And if you want to know more about why that is, we can talk about it in the Q&A portion. But it works with all two-dimensional objects. And so the way, that this, the way that you can make it work is if you take out your phone and you go to Google's search page, you'll see that there's a camera icon. If you turn on that camera icon and you take a picture of what you're standing in front of, it automatically scans that object and gives you back search results. And the very first search result that you're going to get back is a direct link to the Met's website for that particular object. So it's a super fast way to be able to take out your phone, take a picture, all of a sudden you get a link back to that object information on the Met's website. So the question is, how do you make sure it's the first search result? Um, Google, <laughs> I wish I could say this off the record, um, Google will not guarantee that it's the first result. But the, the technology that they have, what they do is they create a thumbprint of your image. And so when you take a picture of it, it goes up into the cloud, it reads that image, finds a matching thumbprint, and then gets back results. And because they know that that image came from the Metropolitan Museum and they have a link to our website, so far, 100% of the time, it's the first result that you get back. Um, but they won't guarantee that, that it will always be the first, because um, technology changes all the time. So once you have the object information, because you're on the mobile website, you can also access information about that gallery, because every gallery that we have at the Met has a gallery overview, which is on the Met's website, which is optimized for your phone. So you can see how this is one big circular experience. Now, the, the first app that the Met did was uh, a, little, a little about two years ago, and it was for an exhibition called Guitar Heroes. And an app is different from a mobile website in that an app is where you really want to package content into an application that you download to your phone. And, and I would say you, you really should do an app when you want someone to have a very curated experience. If you just want to give them information, just basic information, I would say do a mobile website. But if you really want to steer someone down a certain kind of path and have a curated type experience, an app is, per is perfect for doing that. So with this exhibition, the premise of the exhibition is that it was about three generations of Italian-American guitar makers in New York. They're called luthiers, it's a guitar maker. And there's all these fantastic guitars in these exhibitions, in this exhibition. And there's so many stories about these guitars, stories about who played them and how, like what shows were they in and how did they influence future generations of guitars and what were the guitar makers like and just fantastically great stories in addition to the fact that it's really great to be able to hear what they sound like. And so we worked with the curator, Jason Dobney, to take a lot of archival material 
and footage of these guitars being played. And then we created a lot of new content. So we brought in musicians and we filmed them playing the guitars and we captured audio of what those actual instruments sounded like. And we packaged all of this into an app. And the app was available for you to download through iTunes for free, but you could also rent an iPod when you were at the exhibition. And so again, this is using media to be able to go so many levels further of your understanding about an actual instrument so you can hear it, you can see it being played, you can hear the musicians talking about why they thought it was the greatest guitar they've ever owned. And now it's in the Mets collection. So it was really a, a fantastic way to use an app. But of course, because you really shouldn't think about media being confined to one particular space, all the content that is on that app is also available on the website that was created for that exhibition. So it's an entirely different experience. The app allows you to have a very personalized way in which you navigate an exhibition. But if you're just really interested in watching a musician play a guitar from the Mets collection, you can access that video on the Mets website. And so all that content lives on. And then I'll finish up by uh, showing you one of the first mobile games that we just did at the Met. And we've, um, we, we really started to branch out in doing mobile games because it allows us to really sort of reach a, not only does it allow us to reach a younger audience, but mobile games is becoming a really good way to reach an audience who comes to your museum frequently because it gives them a different way to be able to experience a collection. And so this was, we did this mobile game for the opening of the new American Paintings Galleries at the Met, which launched this past spring. And there is a, a group of teens, group of teenagers, who work with our education department. And they wanted to create a game around the opening of the American Wing Paintings Galleries. And so they were working with the education department to create a game that they could all play together. And then they came to us and said, is there any way that we could incorporate media in this. And we said, yeah, actually, let's make this into a mobile game, because that would not only would it be fun to play, but it can extend its life, and anyone could play it. They loved it. So the, um, the premise of the game is that Madame X has been murdered. Madame X is a woman who you see featured up here in this John Singer Sargent painting. So Madame X has been murdered, and you have to figure out who killed Madame X. And the suspects, are all people who are featured in portraits in the American wing. And the possible weapons are all vessels or objects that are featured in the American wing. The possible crime scene are all period rooms that are located in the American wing. And then the witnesses are all people who are featured in portraits. And so, the, obviously Madame X was not killed, but um, the information that you get about the objects that you see in the galleries is factual information. The, the statements that they give and the tips that they give to help you understand who killed her are completely fictitious. So it's a, it's a really fun way to get someone to be able to go into a collection that they may or may not be familiar with, and all of a sudden, through this game and through this activity, they're learning about works of art that they may not have been that interested in, or they have a whole new way in which they experience those objects. And so what we did is um, we also created this trailer or this movie, small clip, to help explain the game. But we also did this because it's a good way to be able to promote the game. And so I'll play for you the trailer. And so again, this, this trailer was 
widely disseminated. It's available on the Mets website. It was circulated through YouTube. It became a very, very good promotional piece to get people excited about playing this game. And the event was heavily blogged about. The uh, teen group has their own blog that's hosted on the Mets site. They did several blog posts about this. And they also heavily shared the event. They all got dressed up, which is why they have mustaches on. But um, so the, the event was heavily photographed and circulated through Facebook. And since then, the, the game really has become something that is anyone can use it. We developed it in HTML5, so it works on any tablet, any iPhone. You don't have to download it as an app. And in fact, at the end of November, a, a group of adults came to the Met to play the game together. And you don't need to even play it in a group, but it was actually just really kind of cool to see how this took on a life of its own and that it actually was something that was played in groups. And one of the other fascinating things about it is when we, when we did it with the teens, over the back a few months ago when we did it, the Met didn't provide any devices. So the teens actually brought their own devices to play it. And what was kind of fascinating to me is that I would say more than half of them showed up without a device, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. We, we were promoting this event for teenagers to play that was a mobile game, and we weren't supplying devices, and more than half of them showed up without one. And what was really great about that is all, because it was a big event, all these teenagers started to create groups, and they played it in groups. And they didn't know each other at all. And all of a sudden, you had these teenagers who were meeting each other for the very first time, sharing a device, going through the galleries, doing this game together. So it was, it was a really, really cool experience. So I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, in, in many respects, we're living in a digital culture, and a digital culture where increasingly people expect to be online anywhere and at any time. And that is directly impacting museums and it, in a couple of different ways. In, in one way, it means that people are bringing their devices to museums, and they're expecting that they can actually do things with it. They want to photograph the works that are in our collection, and, and there's definitely issues around copyright, but people want to photograph these works of art, and they want to do Instagram with it, and they want to do Pinterest, and they want to tweet it, and they want to post it on Facebook, and it's their way of engaging with our collections. This is what's happening in our museums today, and is only going to increase. So not only is there that level of engagement that's happening, which I think is really positive, there's also an expectation that they can access information about the works of art on view, not only on their devices, but certainly on websites, and that the collections that they see in the galleries, they should be able to see it when they go home. The other thing that we're starting to see is a real expectation of extending that experience. So if someone had a really wonderful experience with an exhibition or an object in the galleries, they want to go home and keep keep going with that experience. And I show you on the bottom of the screen, this is an image from the Alexander McQueen Costume Institute exhibition that happened two summers ago at the Met. It was one of the Met's most heavily attended, most popular exhibitions ever. It was an incredible, incredible exhibition, an incredible immersive audio video experience just lines around the block, no kidding, to see this exhibition. And I'll say there's nothing like seeing a work of art in person. There's, there was nothing like experiencing this Alexander McQueen exhibition in person. But all the video that was in there, we of course also made available on the Met's website. And not only did we do that, we actually shot footage of all of the galleries. So the entire installation, it's, a t it's almost like a 10 minute video, with the curator narrating for you a personal tour of everything that you were seeing with all of the great audio and video sound. And we made that available on the website while that exhibition was going on. And I point this out to say that anyone who says, if you put this stuff online, are you going to detract from people wanting to come see it in person? It, it certainly didn't happen with McQueen. And, and in my whole career, I would say it's quite the opposite. The more that you put content online, the more that you let people share what's in museums and allow them to be able to tell their stories, the wider of an audience that you can reach, the more that you actually excite, inspire, and encourage people to want to come see that work of art in person.
So, thank you. So we can do questions, if you have them, on any, anything. It, it, could, it could be this, but I can talk about anything digital, or at least I'll certainly try. So yes. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering if you could just briefly talk about what the Met is doing to kind of preserve all the digital things that, you know, 25 years from now, people will still be able to access the iPhone apps if they want to with the way technology is changing? It's a really great question. So the, um, the, the department that I oversaw at the Met was a, 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 it's a very, very big department. And the reason it's so big is because it represents what I like to refer to as the full life cycle of digital media. So that department is made up of collection management team, digital asset management team, all of the content creators, the developers, and then the public facing sites, the website, social media, and, and all of that. And the reason they're all together in one department is specifically to ensure that any digital interpretation that we create is well documented and well managed in systems so that it becomes an extension of the documentation that exists on the collection. So in a collections management system, you have all the scholarly information that's provided by the curators and by the conservators. All of the rich interpretive media that we're creating around that is being managed in a digital asset management system with proper metadata, proper rights information, proper authorship that can then allow its preservation, migration, and, and hopefully access for as, as far as we can imagine. And I'll, I'll just sort of add to it because it's an interesting tidbit. Um, the, the Met has actually been shooting film for over 70 years. And when I arrived at the Met, a lot of that was, was kind of all over the place. Some of it was in the archives, some of it was on servers, some of it was on hard drives, some of it was inventory, some of it was not. And there's a major effort now to take all of that rich media that has actually been created over the last 70 years and centralize it into a database, which is gonna open up a whole new wealth of content to be able to make accessible to audiences. Um, I understand that you're trying to have the visitor experience as minimal as possible with the media that you're showing while they're seeing the artwork, but how do you make sure that they understand that you have applications such as Google Goggle without um, actually putting the signs all over the artwork? Because it's, it's kind of hard, like when I went to Ment, I didn't know about this application. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how do you make sure that visitors find out about it? It's, um, it's, it's actually incredibly hard because what, what you don't want to do is completely kind of litter a museum with all this stuff of do this, do that. And it's something that we, we're trying to address right now at the Met because you, you really don't know that you can do these things. We, we reach a lot of people letting them know about it through Twitter and through Facebook and, and word of mouth. But when you're in the galleries, it's actually really quite difficult. What we've been talking about doing is having information available as you enter the galleries. So instead of having it on every object label, which can get kind of messy, you can, you can have a Wi-Fi symbol when you enter the galleries, a Wi-Fi symbol when you enter the museum saying this museum is wired. And then with, with something like Google Goggles, it's a, it's a little bit harder to do. So what we've talked about doing is having a, sort of a printout of here are all the digital things that you can do when you're at the Met today. Galleries are wired, op open your phone, go to metmuseum.org. This is what the public Wi-Fi looks like. When you're there, use a camera on Google to be able to search for things and just packaging it all into like a brochure that you hand out, which is what we're thinking is probably the most effective way to do it, especially with Google Goggles because it just, it's, um, it's one of those things that it's kind of hard to explain, but once someone does it, it's, it's super fast. And, I tried it out. I mean, I even did it on, in the new Islamic galleries, there, there's lots of textiles that have very kind of similar looking patterns. And I thought, Google is never going to be able to pick up on this. And it was perfect in finding a match. So it's, it's a great, and I actually think um, voice recognition searching and image recognition searching is going to become increasingly popular. So let's start with you in the front, and then I'll go to you next. 
Good evening. You said uh, questions about anything. Sure. So here's my question. <laughs> I've always wondered uh, about, um, like, uh, for the museums uh, as big as the Met or the Lure, uh, have you ever uh, tried something like this? If someone uh, wants to see, for example, the Met, whole of the Met, everything in it, uh, not like uh, spending about one hour uh, in front of just one picture, but so let's say 10 minutes or 15 minutes at each picture. How many days does it take to, to finish the whole museum? Because, you know, I've spent one uh, whole day, but I couldn't finish it. So how, how long should we, should we really uh, take for our, uh, from our time to finish it? Because I really want to do it, and I want to know if you've, if you've ever made a research about it, if you really know the answer for this. I don't know the answer, but we've actually talked about this. Okay. And, and it's, it's, many people on my staff talked about it because they love the Met. And they're, they're constantly saying there's no way that you can do this all at once. And so we've, um, we haven't come up with the answer yet of, of what, it, what it actually takes. But we've, we've talked a lot about you know, if, if you were to, we could, we could certainly do the math and, and kind of figure it out. But what they were more kind of interested in is if you were to piece it all together in a slideshow, it would be like, this is your three hour tour of looking at every work in every gallery going around. And the, the only reason we, I, I thought it was a really fun idea, and the only reason we kind of didn't go further with it is the fear that you would create the expectation that someone had to do that. And what instead it's, and this is a kind of a philosophical thing, but it's, you know, instead what we want our visitors to understand is you don't need, it's impossible to do the Met in one day. And, and we completely recognize that people may not have the good fortune or luxury to come back, but we, instead of trying to see as much as they possibly can, we'd rather try to help them with, well, what, what do you want to see today? And then guide them to those particular galleries and hope that they have the most meaningful engagement with those galleries and feel leaving, when they feel like when they left the Met, it was awesome and they hope to someday come back. Um, but I'm sure, you know, actually at MoMA, there's, you may have seen this online, um, someone at MoMA did something, a visitor took pictures in all of their modern galleries and quickly did it as a slideshow that you can watch and it's like MoMA in five minutes kind of, kind of thing. So it is, there are renegades out there who are doing it. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question about exhibitions that are theme-oriented. Let's say there's an exhibition that tells the history of a city. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of uh, digital media is used or could be used? Because these were all object-oriented. And I'm just curious. Sure. So. Um I specifically was focusing tonight on permanent collection related media because we see less of that in museums. We actually see more media related to exhibitions. And when um, any, any time that we approach doing exhibitions for, or media for exhibitions, we really like to focus on the permanent collection objects that are in that exhibition. And this is mostly to build interpretation about a permanent collection. And because if you do it on a loan object, once that loan object is gone, the media is no longer useful, or it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a way to extend its life. But there's, there's lots of ways that you can use media to enhance one's experience in an exhibition. So what, uh, digital productions works really well. So for example, we recently did a show on um, Bernini cast works and, in clay. And the, we had a digital projection up on the wall that showed how those clay works were modeled after Bernini's that are in Rome and in other places. And so it was a way to give you context of this particular clay work directly relates to that Bernini that's in Rome that's not in this exhibition, but we want you to understand that association with it. So digital projections works well. We, we also did an exhibition on um, Gertrude Stein and her collection. And we had a, a room that was set up that cycled through different decades of her, what her home looked like with all these works of art in it. So you could go through the exhibition and see these works of art that Gertrude Stein collected, and then go into this empty room 
that was just digital projections around you that cycled through different decades where you could actually see what it looked like in her room. Uh, another example is we, um, we had this exhibition called uh, Electrotypes, which is, uh, Electrotypes is a technique that allows you to make a replica of an object. And there's actually a lot of works in the Met's collection that are th these replicas that was done uh, a long time ago and it was mostly done for teaching purposes, but they're exact replicas of what you see. And so there was this, this exhibition that was done that brought together a lot of these replicas next to the original works of art and then explained the electrotyping process. And for that exhibition, we actually did an animation to help explain the electrotyping process because it's so complicated. And that was featured in the title, Wall. But the, the electrotyping process that we showed directly related to a, an object in the Met's collection. So even after that exhibition closed, that animation can live on related to that particular object. Um, so th does that help with some examples? Yeah. yeah. I mean, those are examples within the exhibition itself. Sure. Yeah. On site, where you can actually, I mean, that's what it was wondering about more so like in the Met you go home and you know you can look at the art book. Has there been anything done similar to that with respect to other types of exhibitions like where you go home and, and you actually feel like you're going to the exhibition. exhibition and you can actually simulate that exhibition ex experience? There um, not, not ones that I have seen successfully done. And it's, it's, um, it's a fair amount of work to try to actually recreate the, the physical experience one has with an exhibition online. So mostly it's the, the content that's reproduced, but not the, the closest we've come is the example with McQueen where we actually shoot film of that exhibition. But it's, that's, a, that's a very sort of one-way interaction with it. We're actually not letting someone interact or navigate their way through an exhibition space. There's, um, there's a, a, a couple of museums who have done it really well with photography. So um, the Detroit Institute has done incredible 3D photography of installation spaces with a company called Sensecape. And it actually allows you, it, 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 the photography is so good, it, you really feel like you're there. And it allows you to actually go from room to room and then go up to an object and click on it and get information about it. And that's like the closest example that I've seen that works really, really good. And the um, Sensecape has worked with a couple of museums in doing this. So if you uh, look them up, or I'm happy to write it down for you after the, the Q&A session, you'll see some really great examples that I think replicate what you're actually looking for. Thank you. You're welcome. That we don't put, sorry, say the question. Social media accounts. Your Facebook and Instagram read the Yeah, there's no good read. The question is why we don't have our social media featured on our homepage. It's, um, it's, it's not a good, it's, we should be. The answer is absolutely. Um, and you'll see it really soon, in about a couple of months. We, um, it was, it, it actually, I don't want to say it was a mistake, because we, we learn all the time, but Social for the Met has been something that has been very much outside the Met's website. And we have very active Facebook followers and tweeters. And it's for museums, it's, we're actually quite successful with our social media. We, we do not have it integrated well with the website. And so one of the things that you'll see in about three months on the Met's website is a much stronger presence. It's going to be called community that brings social into the Met's website. And, and really creates a sort of dynamic sense of there's this active community out there who we're engaged with, and to make that more of an integrated part of the Mets website so that we can create greater exposure for it. So it's, it's a very good observation, and thank you. And you'll see it soon. How much of these interactivity and uh, app ideas come from your staff, or do you work with a, a creative agency? That's a really good question. So on the digital media team that I had 
at the Met and at the Getty had a lot of creative producers. And they come up with ideas all the time. And I always say, first and foremost, we represent the needs of the curators, the conservators, the educators. The, when we can carve out a certain amount of time in our schedule where their ideas can come first, but really we're at service to the institution. And so what, what ends up happening is a curator, sorry, a curator will come to us and, and he or she will say, I want to do an app for an exhibition. Or, I want to do an app for something. And we always say, okay, don't say, let's not say app. Let's just step back for a moment. Tell us, what, are the, what is the message that you want to get across about that particular object or that installation or that exhibition? What are the stories that you want to tell? Do you have an intended audience in mind? Like, is there a target audience that you're thinking about or is this just for everybody? Like, what are the goals and the reasons for doing it? And then from that ex exploration, my team goes back and they come up with what are the best uses of media to actually reach those interpretive goals for that audience. Go back to the curator and say, we could do it with this technology and this media. Here are some storyboards of what it might look like. And then it becomes a dialogue. So curators will push back a little bit about something else they had in mind. My creative team pushes back. And in, in the end, actually, it becomes a really wonderful partnership where it is very much a shared creative idea that comes from a digital media team and a curatorial team. As I know, you are using the, the museum system for the collection management system. But I wonder that in which content management system that you build your website and how to integrate the collection management system to, your, to the website in which way? So I, I'll, and I, I'll share with you lots of different systems. At the, at the Met, we have a collections management system that, that manages all the documentation on the collection. And that's from a vendor called Gallery Systems which does a lot of collection management systems for museums all around the world. The digital asset management system is called MediaBin, and it's a major digital asset management system. Those two systems are very tightly integrated. The website is powered by a content management system called Sitecore, which is a Microsoft product. Both the digital asset management system and the collection management system directly talk to that content management system, so the data flows through that CMS out to the website. And then we have another content management system, Drupal, which is open source, that we use to support all the in-gallery media. And that also talks to the collections management system. And we're in the process of having that talk to the web content management system. So long, sort of complicated way of saying we have the right system for the right type of content that we're managing. All are very tightly integrated and seamlessly publish information out to wherever we need it to go. Uh, are you concerned that the presence of so many people taking photos might take away from somebody else's experience at the gallery? Yes and no. So. Um, I used to be. I, I used to think that in some ways it was a distraction, but I also kind of just feel that way about having hundreds of people standing in front of a work of art. So it's, um, I, I, what bothers me more about phones is not taking the pictures because I, I think it shows someone engaging with an object. It's, it's actually no different than someone with an audio guide who's spending a minute standing in front of an object with their headsets on. It's just a different device that they're standing in front of it with. So it, it doesn't bother me so much. And you know, places like the Met are just, they're so, they're just so crowded with people that it doesn't seem to be interfering that much because people are mostly, are, they're, just, they're just packed with people. What worries me more about phones is people who then use them. And so we have used them to actually answer the phone and start talking in the galleries. I think that's a much more disruptive experience. And so we, we encourage people to use the phones. We let them take pictures in the galleries. We say it's perfectly fine to do. Obviously, they can take a picture and use Google goggles. Um, if they actually answer the phone and start having a conversation, we've asked the guards that if that then becomes disruptive to the visitor experience, to ask them to leave the galleries. But taking pictures is it's OK with me.
Ben Türkçe konuşacağım. I will be speaking in Turkish. I am I'm an education specialist after the establishment of I am an education specialist. I'm a teacher. And after the establishment founding of private museums, we have got the opportunity to show the museums closer for our children, for our students. Istanbul Modern Museum, for example. My child has grown up in this museum. I was bringing her to the summer courses. It has got a great contribution. So I would like to thank the private museums for their contribution to our children. So as an education specialist, three or four times we do have some visits related to our subjects that we have in our curriculum. Maybe I am just uh, dealing with the issues that you have mentioned, but I believe that you may have some recommendations for us. For example, the museums that we visit may have some workshops. And as the teachers, we are going to the museums and we are preparing some booklets, informative booklets for our children in order to make use of these booklets during the workshops. For example, when we bring the children to the workshop area, we are just drawing their attention to that site, to that center. So how you are carrying on such kind of school-related activities in your country? And do you have any recommendations for such kind of school visits or students or educational site? It's, um, it, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, there's a lot of different things that can be done. So in a more f formal sense, the MET makes a lot of teacher resources available on its website or packets that you can bring with you to help with course curriculum or course curricula. We've um, started taking that course curricula and making it interactive on our website so that you can actually incorporate some of the media that we're creating as an extension to what a school visit might do. So we, working closely with the education department, know that you might bring a third grade class or a fourth grade class or seven-year-olds or eight-year-olds who are meant to come and learn about history and they're gonna do it with a certain collection and their the curriculum has been developed. But we have really great content that we've created that can really sort of supplement that. And we're making, we're actually adding that on to the curriculum so that it becomes an extension of what you can do with a class visit. The, the other thing that we have been doing is mostly through a dialogue with educators and with teachers is letting them know about the new content that we're creating. And so that when they come with, or they do their own self-guided school visits, they know when we've created a new animation or a new interactive, and we encourage them to bring iPads that have that on it so that it becomes another way to get a school group engaged while they're actually visiting. So some of it formally is being done through packaging it with curriculum that's made available on the website. Some of it is informally being done through having a relationship with educators who we know come to the Met all the time. And then keeping them current and up to date with all the new cool stuff that we're creating, which really can help with one's learning experience. Because, I mean, it's, and you, you'll know this as an educator, it's people really learn differently. And so being able to use video or animation or things that show techniques could really be in a very effective way for a young student to actually understand something about a work of art that wasn't available before. Does that help? You're welcome. I should also say, I, I have this, I kind of have this fantasy. Um, I, I, we never got to do this at the Met, but I, I kind of have this, uh, this, I, this is something I'd love to do, and it relates to a school visit, is at the Met, there is this area where school kids gather around just before they go into the galleries. And th there is a, a big projection wall behind them. And I've always thought, wouldn't it be great if actually you could have a teacher stand there and you know that they're gonna go, let's say, into, uh, and let's take it the Islamic galleries. They're gonna go into the Islamic galleries that day. You could just open up the folder for the Islamic galleries. All the objects appear from the Islamic galleries. You can drag down the ones that you wanna go see. 
the, you can have the video and the animations appear alongside it. And you can actually start your visit with the, the class learning about the objects and what they're about to go see and have a focal point to discuss it and then go into the actual galleries and have your conversation there. It'd be super, super cool. Love to see it happen someday. A change in the experience for the disabled visitor, and how is how is this either increasing or enhancing or detracting from the experience of the disabled visitor? It's, so it's actually everything that I've seen with respect to digital media enhancing the visitor experience is that it's actually making it more accessible for those with certain disabilities, and so. Um, you know, certainly with, with having really effective audio, you have a different way in which if you are visually impaired to be able to understand a work of art that you're standing in front of. All of the videos that we do have closed caption, so you can actually read them if you're hard of hearing. And then we, um, we recently did at the Met a 3D printing hackathon. And, and I love that the Met let us do a hackathon. This is, kind of a, a big deal for them. But what we, what we did is we invited 3D artists to come to the Met, and we, we partnered with a 3D printer. And if you don't know 3D printers, they actually can, you can print out a 3D replica from a printer of something. So we, this was totally new technology, and we thought we wanted to learn about what this technology means to the Met. It doesn't mean anything to us. So we, we partnered with the education department, with the curators, with this 3D printer, we invited 24 3D artists to come to the Met for two days. We allow them to go into the galleries, photograph objects, and then using 3D software called 123D Catch, it takes or images it, renders it into a 3D model. They then could create any sort of manifestation of it. They could either create an exact replica or do a whole new creation of it. And then they printed it out onto printers. And one of the things that we learned through this, because we had this very focused study afterwards about, OK, now so what, was that the 3D model was a really good way to help those who are visually impaired understand an object, because you now have a 3D replica of it. And they can feel it. They can touch it. They know what it actually feels like. And so it was through doing something extremely experimental with a hackathon and artists that we realized this great potential for a, a particular audience with disabilities. All right, you all good? Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>